aside a few moments for family and friends uh, to say your final goodbye. What we'd like to do is invite anybody that wants to pass by the casket a final time. Once you've done that, we'll invite you to retake your seat. Following that, we'll have a word of prayer as a family together in this room, and then begin with services. Gentlemen, for those of you serving as our pallbearers today, just go ahead and sit with your family. And at the conclusion of the service, we'll call you forward to assist with the casket. 
brothers and sisters, the time is yours for whoever wants to come up and pay a final farewell.
Brothers and sisters, we'd like to go ahead and have the family prayer now by Richard Balkerman. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the opportunity we have to be together as a family and friends this day to honor the life of his soul with help for them. We thank thee for the gospel for the uh, salvation and the saving words as have been restored these latter days that allow us to be together for eternity as a family. We're so grateful for the honor that we've had to know Isolda, to have her in our lives. We're so grateful for the service that she has provided to us and to many others during her mortal existence. So grateful that she's reunited once again. With Carl, Rosie, and my dad. It's time we ask you to bless us, it will be comforted. Bless us that this meeting will have my spirit. For these things we pray in the name of my Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
brothers and sisters, we are grateful that we have the opportunity to come and celebrate the life of Zelda Isole Pantum. I'll call her our spunky sister. Uh, I'll never forget the first time I've ever met Zelda. I knew I was an instant fan. She was a sweet lady, one I grew to love. We'll go ahead and start with an opening song, Sweet Hour of Prayer, after which our opening prayer will be given by Robert Benson. And we'll go to that point.
Our most beloved Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful for the opportunity which we have to come here today to give our gratitude and to feel the great tenderness that exists at a time like this that we can bid for a season how feeders aim to Isilda. We are so grateful for her life, for her example, for her lighting the great torch of the gospel that has brought so many to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're grateful for her service for those both living and those that have passed on and those that will yet come. She has truly been a path leader that will show us all what it means to be a great disciple and to be diligent in our service. We are grateful for friends and family that are here today. and We're grateful for the opportunity for hearts to touch one another, that they may feel the goodness that exists and to remember those things that would prod us on to be even better. We give gratitude not only for her life, but we give gratitude for her son Richard, his wife Tina, and all those children that are that are here and have meant so much to her and have meant so much to extended family in the community. We'd ask that thou would bless them with a great solace, with a great understanding and sympathy and empathy for those things that have been brought into their life by his own. We are grateful for a living prophet. We're grateful for those words that exist in revealed scripture, that we may have a path to follow ourselves, that we may likewise have the opportunity to be reunited as families for eternity. These things we thank thee for this day, along with a remembrance of the atonement of my son Jesus Christ and the path and the opportunity we have to be reunited in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll go ahead and announce the rest of the prayer. Okay. We'll first hear our way, which will be reading by Tina Alperman. Then we'll have grandchildren and memories from Tish, Emily, and Ian. Then we'll have a musical number, Omare Mayfu, uh, to be selection. Then a live sketch by her son, Richard Alperman. And then I'll have to take a few moments of that for some remarks and before that point. Need the steps to Okay, Alfredo saying, which means, and tell me it again. Isolda Lisa Loda Tasha Palfreyman passed away on September 4, 2021, in North Logan, Utah. At the age of 91, she was born August 1st, 1930, in Breslau, Germany, now Warclaw, Poland, to Ernst and Frieda Tesha, the fourth of six children. She lived in various locations in Germany during World War II. At the end of World War II, she lived in Ulm, Germany, where she worked as a radio specialist. She immigrated to the United States from Ulm in September of 1958. Isolde joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in October of 1956 while living in Germany. She married Robert Grant Palfreyman. She would refer to Robert as, with her accent as Robert. On September 29, 1958, in the Logan, Utah LDS Temple, the two had met while he was serving as a missionary in Germany. She served in many church callings, including an ordinance worker in the Ogden and Logan temples. She became a U.S. citizen in August of 1963. She enjoyed ballroom dancing, gardening, Christmas traditions, and dressing up in Halloween costumes for the trick-or-treaters. She was known for her crown jewel salad. She also enjoyed visiting Yellowstone National Park in the U.S. She worked as a seamstress, data entry operator, and finance clerk. <coughs> After marrying Robert, they lived in Pasco, Washington, where their first son Richard and daughter Rosvita were born. They later moved to Ogden, Utah, where their third child, Carl Robert, was born. In 2003, 
she moved to Logan, Utah. She survived by her son Richard, Bruce, Tina, Pal Freeman, three grandchildren, Tesha Johns, Pal Freeman, Emily Rose, Chad Gunnell, and Ian Robert, Marley, Pal Freeman, three great grandchildren, Oakley Bell, Pal Freeman, Crew Robert, Pal Freeman, and Ellie Olivia Gunnell, and her sister Friedel and Alec Page of Red Bay, Alabama. She was preceded in death by her daughter Rosvita at 10 months, her son Carl at 22 years of age, her husband Robert in February of 2000, brother Gerhard Tesha, sisters Irena Fuchs, Ava Tesha, and Irma Ryle. Her siblings were residing in Germany at the times of their death. She's always really good at going to the temple, and she always put my name and my husband's Chad name in the temple whenever we had um, a test coming up. She was always very concerned if we had any tests coming up. Yeah, she she knew I wasn't super good at tests. So she would always ask me if I passed after I took my test. <laughs> I was dead, but sometimes she would question it. But you know, Oma, she she lived a long life. She was 91, went through World War II. Had a couple kids pass, moved to the States. She had a lot of stories. If you could get her to tell those stories, she, she'd tell you a lot. But one thing I always would ask her, she'd come over almost every Sunday for dinner, just with our kids and my dad's house and the grandkids. And I'd ask her, you know, the long life you've lived, what's, what's the coolest thing you've seen? What's the coolest thing you've done? Or what's something that sticks out? She'd grab my hand, she'd look at me, a little confused by the question. And, Pull me close and say, there's two things that come to mind. And one of them was, when our whole family comes to Sunday dinner, and you guys are all here, it melts my heart. I'm like, oh, that's, that's really nice. Oh, Molly, we love you and love being here. And the second thing was the cell phone. She told me she loved the cell phone. And I kind of threw me through a loop. I was like, I wasn't expecting that one after you said, you know, family, and now it's the cell phone. She said, the reason why the cell phone, because she can keep in contact with her sister in Alabama. And before, when she separated from her, she couldn't always talk to her. So she was so thankful that there was a cell phone where they were across the states, she would be able to talk to her. So there's two things that she loved in her life, the family Sunday dinners and the cell phone to talk to her sister. <laughs> I'm going to add to that because I actually, Oma was really good. She was kind of tech savvy. I don't know how many of you guys have iPhones, but there's some of those special features where you can like send confetti or some of those other things if you send a text message. I didn't know how to do that. I think she taught me how to do that. <laughs> okay. Emily's still in 2005. <laughs> um, one thing that Oma said before she died, she wanted to see all her grandchildren married. I disappointed her in that. I'm not married and I have no kids. One day though, at least these two um, did that dream for her. <laughs> Try. If anyone knows of any single eligible name, don't we can talk after. Plus or minus 10 years. Um, one of my other thoughts is I'm just very grateful that Oma had the courage and faith uh, to become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I often think if she did become a convert, I'm not quite sure where I would be in my life. So I'm very grateful for her courage to change religions and uh, her strong testimony. Yeah, speak, speaking of religion, I, I went on a mission about 10 years ago, and there's a story that comes to mind with Oma and my missionary manners. I was, I don't know, 12 years old probably when this story happened, and 
we were eating dinner, I think it was like a Sunday dinner, and we're eating hamburgers, cheeseburgers, and I'm just eating with my hands, and she's looking at me with this disgusted fake look on her face, and I was like, oh my, what's, what's wrong? She's like, well, if you're eating your food with your hands, you'll never be a good missionary. Yep. And I was kind of surprised. I was like, it's a hamburger, Oma, you eat these with your hands. And she just kind of shook her head and said, no, you'll never be a good missionary. And it stuck with me the whole mission. I don't know if I was a good missionary from me with my hands. So sometimes dinner, a missionary, dinners, I didn't know what to do. I would just picture her in my mind. Like, do I use the utensils or not, Oma? What would you do? But she taught us how to use utensils, finger foods or not. Well, she also introduced us to German food. I don't think we would know what like Tabers and Liverwurst and other things are, and I enjoy some of them. So she introduced us to that. That was on my list too. I don't think we maybe had as many opportunities to be introduced to German food. The German food that I really like is uh, Liverwurst, Weisswurst, and Black Forest cake. <laughs> Yeah, I was never a huge fan of German food. <laughs> like, I like part of it, the liverwurst and stuff I can't say. Tavers. Tavers. That's what I like. like, that stuff's good on the bread and little spreads, but yeah. some other stuff I kind of made sure if we had another dinner to go to during those Sunday dinners that <laughs> I'd rather go that way and tell my parents I'm sorry, but we gotta go visit my wife's family because, you know, they have hamburgers. I'm eating with my hands tonight. <laughs> so, but one thing with Oma, it's almost kind of embarrassing to admit. Like, I thought the longest time Oma was her name, <laughs> and no, it's not. The Zolda was her name. I, little growing up, you have Oma and Opa, and you think that's first names. Now Oma is German, and Oma means grandma in German, and Opa is grandpa in German. And I don't think she ever knew I didn't know her first name was Zolda until one time I was giving her Your a mission? blessing. Yeah, it was probably like mission time, so about ten years ago. And my dad told me, okay, this is her full name. And I was like, that's a mouthful. Like, I had no idea. I thought it was Oma. So she probably would smack me knowing that it took so long to realize her first name is Zolda, not Oma. But to me, she, she's always Oma. Ever since we've grown up, ever since I've known her, Oma and Opa, and mostly Oma. And so she made her first name is Oma because she was a grandma. Oh, okay, hopefully. Um, in Ogden, in her first house, I remember there was a big cherry tree. I think it was in the neighbor's house, and I remember having the ladder and climbing up and picking cherries with Oma. And that's the only time I'll eat cherries if they're straight from the tree. And she like taught me how to pick them and obviously spit the seed out so you don't choke to death and die. <laughs> But I remember doing that with you too. Yeah, we did it together. We did that. It was a nice memory. It was, they were tasty cherries. Yeah, so. they were really good. We would fill up huge buckets full. Did you use your hands? Yeah, I did no. use my hands. That was but I spit out. the seat out with my mouth. She probably was disappointed in that. <laughs> One thing I really like about Oma, it's for like this last five years, she told us every year this was her last year of life. Five years go by, and every year she's like, well, this is my last year of life. This is my last year of life. This is what I want. So we made sure, hey, you know, maybe this really is her last year of life, that we would do what she wanted or bring over the grandkids, and she would see Oakley or That's why you got married. crew. And yeah, how did her get married? It's 2015 when I got married. And she was telling us, 2016, 15, this is her last year of life. So we had to hurry. And, well, I guess 2021, she was, she was finally right on that statement. But she, one thing I want to talk about is, she always came to my hockey games, played hockey through high school and growing up, and it wasn't super long of a walk for her, just down the road where she lived. She'd always bring her friends, and she would come and play hockey. Not play hockey. Oh, could you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> she would shoot watch hockey, but she, she got knowledgeable, kind of understand the hitting in the game. And she'd always grab me right after, make sure my bones are okay, look at my head, ask if I could remember anything or my name. And, I think it scared her, but like she loved the thrill, but then she liked watching me get beat up probably, humbled me a little bit, and then making sure I was okay. But I remember her coming and bringing some of her neighbor friends, and it was, it was a good memory. She supported us, and it was really nice. Well, speaking of injuries, now we don't have to lie to her about any surgery or injury we ever had. Oh, yeah. My dad would always make sure, don't tell Oma I broke my back. Don't tell Oma I hurt my shoulder. Don't tell Oma I messed up my eye. <laughs> we had these texts yeah. Sunday dinner. Sunday dinner. Okay, don't know what not to say. Topics. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. 
Exactly. Now we don't have to do that anymore. We can just be free and open well, now. Now you smell the beans. So well, yeah. Know. Oh, she knew. She, she knew. knows now. <laughs> that German in her, she knew things. Yeah, we know. always got hurt, and she always worried about us with those four wheelers and dirt bikes. Every one of us got hurt on a four wheeler dirt bike, except my mom. And she always thought we were kind of reckless in that way. <laughs> My uh, next one that I had was Oma was very passionate about um, learning a musical instrument and education and she did this to all of us where she always wanted to know how our piano practicing was going and also how um, school was going and I, I admire her uh, passion for those things and I think growing up in Germany that would be a luxury of being able to learn how to play a musical instrument. Um, and getting an education. So she's very, very passionate about that. Yeah, I never really did super good with the instruments. Yeah, Emily's the only one bit. that really stuck it out for piano. <laughs> she would still play her songs, which, would you do a musical right now? <laughs> yeah, well, I'd like to hear one last song. She knew me in school and music, but one thing that sticks to mind is Oma's, I have a little girl, Oakley, she's two and a half years old. She's quite the character, and Oma was the first one in the hospital. We find out, you know, Oakley's born in 2019. Oma was there, first one in the hospital. Like, I, I don't even know how she found out. She knew things sometimes. I was very surprised how she knew things. But she's right there, has good old stuffed animal for us, and big box of diapers, and congratulates us, and just had the biggest smile. I'll never forget seeing her face, and she was so excited that we had a, a little girl, and things were going well, and. Remember, she brought us a big big box of diapers, you know, kids, they go to the bathroom a lot. And I don't think we'd use those diapers yet. She gets sizes that sometimes it's like a one-size-fits-all to her, but it's obviously not how a newborn diaper is, and we're still waiting for Oakley to grow into them. But they're sitting on the shelf. One day she'll wear them, or I will, I'm not sure. But she, she tried, and she was there, and put a lot of effort into it. Uh, she did used to always come to my fashion shows back when I did that in high school. She was probably there for every single one, front row cheering me on. That was always nice to have family there. And then she used to visit me when I worked at a tie store in the mall selling men's ties. And she would get pretzel bites and bring them to me. She loved the pretzel bites, which surprised me because they're not very healthy. And Oma kind of didn't eat unhealthy stuff sometimes, but she would always bring me pretzel bites and we would eat them together in my little store. She likes Chick-fil-A too, which is funny too, but it um, that wasn't my next one, but that makes me think of that. Um, she loved to dress up for Halloween. Um, there's some pictures in this slideshow that probably show some of her costumes. And I remember when I was a child, and I think we were probably all at Oma's house, but she let us actually play with her um, Halloween costumes. And I just remember it was a fun time playing dress up with Oma. And I think my favorite costume that I was able to wear was the Indian costume that she had. Emily was always our little Indian. <laughs> the one time, Oma taught me a very, very valuable lesson about saying things if you don't know the meaning to. One time she smacked me on my cheek pretty hard. And it's probably the only time she ever hit me. I was in our room and I was playing with something and sorry for my language and I, I yelled shy stuff. And she was right there and she turned and just slapped me really hard. And I didn't know what was going on or anything and she just stared at me and I was like, I'm sorry, Oma, what's the matter? And turns out shy stuff means shit in German. And I had no idea. I'd heard it from something and I just yelled it. It was from I the don't Born I get the Jason Bourne, the first one. <laughs> See, I guess yeah. I heard it from Jason Bourne. He taught me a swear word in German and she slapped me so hard I had a handprint and from that day on I made sure whatever came out of my mouth I knew the meaning. So it was a good valuable lesson, but I I didn't know what I was saying but that day and man she made sure she straightened me up on that one. So thank you for that. Well, towards the last couple months, she would come to Sunday dinner, and she would eat actually quite a bit. She used to never like clear her plate, and she wouldn't really eat a whole lot. So she would eat so much, and then she would get full. And she told me back when she was in Germany that her and her sisters would just have a drink of cognac, and it would help soothe her stomach, and then she could eat more. <laughs> Haven't tried it yet, but you know, y'all go try that sometime <laughs> in honor of Oma. Um, when I first got married, I was actually afraid to be alone um, at night, and my husband Chad left for the week, and my parents were out of town, and I was really scared to spend the night at my apartment by myself, so I called Oma and asked could I spend the night, because I'm kind of scared right now, and she said, oh yeah, come on over, 
And so she was happy to have me for the night. And then when I woke up, I had to get up and I think go to school early or something like that. And she made me toast and hot chocolate, and it was just really sweet. <laughs> yeah, Emily would come to my room sometimes when she was scared when we were growing up. And spend the night with me. It was nice. <laughs> I know, that sounds probably weird, but I held her with a lot of first. We won't go there, but... Oma, every time I saw her... You love that lady. She always had a story. She would always look at me, and she never really asked how I was doing, which it's okay, I got over that, but... She's always like, how's your wife and how's your kids? How's Marley, how's Oakley, and how's crew? And she, you could tell she really, really, really loved them. And it was really soft and nice to know that she loved my wife and she loved my two kids and then I would kind of tell her what I'm going through I'm like oh yeah this is happening or I don't have a job or I broke this and she just look at me and go well you'll get through it I'm like oh okay <laughs> so from now on every time something she always would just say you know well you'll get through it and made me think you know I think she had a lot more faith in me than I did in myself sometimes I'm like all right well she sees something I don't see so I'll get through it but it was really nice knowing how much she cared for my wife and the two kids we had and she just grab our hands every time and say, tell them I love them. Tell them I love them. And so, we love her. And, yeah. Well, I don't have kids, so <clears throat> I'll use, I'll use my... Um, it was really... Yeah. So I have a 16-month-old daughter. Her name is Ellie. And my husband and I, we've actually been in Nebraska for the last four years. And so we haven't really had a lot of time to see um, Oma and um, Ellie's interaction. And so... The last couple of months we've been here, it's been nice to see Ellie and Oma. Um, Oma really had such a joy whenever she got to be around my daughter, and that it was just nice to see how happy she was when she got to spend some time with Ellie. Um, she told me too, because you know we call Oma his grandma in German, and so I asked her, I was like, well, what's like great grandma? Like, how do you address that in German? And she said, it's Oma Ma. And I thought, oh, that is such a cute little thing. Like, this is Oma Ma. <laughs> and so that will be special to me, and I'm just glad that Ellie got to meet her old mama. Yeah, I'm going to kind of add to that a little bit. It's made me think of a little story with <coughs> Oma with the great grandkids and our little girl, Oakley, the two and a half year old one. Oakley, she, she's kind of timid by people. She doesn't love people in her face, and well, that didn't ever turn down Oma. She'd come right up to her, grab those little cheeks of Oaks, and just go, Oma, Oma, say my name, Oma. And Oakley sometimes just wide eyes, cry and run, and I'm like, it's all right, we'll get there. And right before she passed away, man, the last time we saw her, she almost did that to her, and I was like, oh boy, Oak's gonna run and cry. Oakley just sat there, and then just kind of smiled at her, and you could just tell Oma was so excited that she didn't run or cry away from her. And o Oakley never got to the point to yell Oma back in her face, but she made good eye contact and didn't run, so there was improvements. And it was always fun to watch her with the kids. Uh, my last just point is Oma was sometimes hard to read um, and that's just how she was and sometimes I think people had maybe a hard time understanding um, maybe what she was trying to say um, but I, I honestly think she's the, one of the strongest ladies I ever have met um, and I know she had a really good heart. She uh, loved her family and I'm happy she gets to be with her family on the other side of the veil. And um, just wanted to say I love you, Oma, until we meet again. I'll see you again, Oma. Yeah, she, I, wanna, I got like two more little things and I'll be done talking. But when she was in her last year of life, three years ago, four years ago, she would always call and, Ian, what are you doing? And I'd tell her, I'm in school or I'm not doing this, pretty much homeless, Oma, everything's fine. But she needed to go to the store and get bottled cases of water. I was like, okay, so about every other week, I would get this phone call, she needs a bottle case of water. So I go to Sam's Club, buy like, you know, the 30, put it in her basement or put it up in her room. And I was like, man, she's really staying hydrated. She's, she's just drinking, drinking water, good for Oma. And one time I said, Oma, this is going to last you like the rest of your life. Like you have so much water. And, well, about a month ago, she didn't drink any of it. It's all still just stacked up there and my dad had to go move it all. And I don't know why she was collecting it. This was before COVID times and everyone was collecting things, but she still has those cases of water and some's in our house now in my parents' house. And, she planned yeah, she in advance. Just always wanted to plan and made sure if one bottle went down, she had to get a whole new case. But that's how she was. It's funny. And one thing to end on, I don't know if any of you guys had her hugs. If you ever had an Oma hug, she it was almost like going to the chiropractor. 
<laughs> she, she, she puts you like in this headlock. Yeah. Just go up to you. And I'm gonna use you. <laughs> a little shorter lady. But she'd go up to you and just squeeze you. And sometimes you'd get that right angle, your neck would pop, and you'd almost, oh man, this feels kind of nice. Or other times you can't breathe. So I don't know which ones you're gonna get, but she loved to hug, and it was a whole chokehold with a neck hug, and that's the way she showed. I don't know if that's a German thing, but kind of a two in one. You get the Omaha and go to the chiropractor. I'm gonna miss those, like, even though sometimes they hurt and you were surprised, but we're gonna miss her and have her around for Sunday dinners will be different and we loved her and we'll miss those hugs. We'll miss her. Miss her. And so thanks for coming. Yeah. Bye. You wanna go home? Yeah. Not yet. Okay, before I start my remarks, um, listening to my kids talk about some of their memories, I had a memory that popped in my mind. I, uh, 
had the opportunity to serve in a YSA state for five and a half years, and one of the callings I had was a bishop. As a result of that, we would have young men and young women in our house all the time for dinner, especially on Sundays. And it was interesting to watch my mom's interaction with these young single adults, because sometimes when the young women would be there, she would talk to them just kind of lightly and ask them where they're from and you know things like that. And she would just kind of think, oh, that's nice. But when the young men were there, and she would ask him questions, she was fully engaged in having discussions <laughs> with these young men. So, that was one memory. Thank you all for coming today. I appreciate you being here to honor my mother. Before my father died in 2000, I had asked my mom and dad to write their personal history, which they did. It's interesting to see the difference between my dad and my mom's. My dad's was maybe five pages. And my mom's is considerably more than that. Anyway, so she used her computer to write her talk. And for some reason, she was incredibly self-conscious about her history. She told me that the, the history was done. She did it on her computer, printed it out, and then deleted the file. And she said that we couldn't read it until after she was gone. And I have no idea why she said that, but now that she's gone, I have been reading through it. And I want to share some of the things that she had included in her history. Um, kind of as a lead up to that, last Sunday in my elders' quorum, we were talking about President Nelson's conference talk about faith in the parable of the mustard seed. And in Matthew 17, 20, it says, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. And as I listened to our poem's discussion on this topic, I reflected upon the many mountains that my mother had moved in her life. And I want to share some of those with you. Mom was born, as her obituary said, August 1st, 1930, in Bristol, Germany. She was a fourth of six children. My mom doesn't say much about her childhood, except that her mom was very strict and that she and her sisters liked to tease her brother, that her dad was her best friend, and at this point in their life, they had a sheltered life. At some point prior to 1939, they moved from Breslau to Neuholm, which is a little town on the Danube River. In September of 1939, her family was getting ready to move back to Breslau. However, before they could move, the Second World War started. Her father served in the German military and was activated. Mom became sick during this time and was undernourished because of the rationing that the government had implemented. The government took her from her family and put her in the fa uh, home of a family that lived in the Black Forest area. And that way she had more access to food because of the agricultural setting in their home. She lived with them for about six months. When she was 10 years old, she was in Breslau with her grandmother, and during that time there, she relays the following story. One day, our grandmother took us out for a picnic in the park. We noticed three big trucks. Two of them were loaded with people, and the third was being loaded with more people. Mom says she couldn't understand what was going on. Apparently, there was a child that was being loaded onto the truck that was crying that they were hungry. My mom went over to the truck to give her a sandwich, and the SS soldier pushed my mom away and told her to leave them alone, or she would end up going with them. After this incident, my grandmother took my mom and her siblings home and explained to who, to who these people were and what the yellow star on their clothing meant. This did seem to make sense to my mom, because she didn't think they were any different than she. From this point on, she greatly feared the men in the black uniforms. When German children turned 10 years of age, they were required to join the Hitler Youth. Since her family had gone from Neuilly for a while to Breslau, they had been attending the meetings. That didn't go unnoticed. When they got back to Neuilly, they were visited by the Gestapo. They spoke to Mom's mother and told her that if they didn't attend, they would be sent to a concentration camp. 
Because of this, my mom's dad was given leave from his military post to go home and talk with his wife to make sure that the kids went to the Hitler Youth meetings. My mother's parents weren't very fond of the Nazi party, but the kids attended the meetings faithfully. At this time, my grandfather had given my grandmother a handgun and said to use it on themselves if the Gestapo ever came back to take them away. He must have had some knowledge of what would have happened if they were taken away. The war, the war was very hard on my mom and her family. They spent a lot of time in bomb shelters. Mom was often sick and required medical care, but couldn't receive medicine because they were needed for the soldiers. Food was scarce and was rationed. They would get one and a half liters of watered down milk and one loaf of bread per week for six people. They would also get one kilogram of meat per month, and again, this was for six people. Needless to say, they were starving. In 1944, due to the bombing, mom and her siblings had to leave Noyon and walk out into the country with only the clothes that they were wearing. They had to find shelter wherever they could. They eventually got to a small town about 15 kilometers away, and a farm lady took them in. Later, mom and one of her sisters was able to get back to Noyol to go to their apartment. It had been partially bombed. The cellar was still intact. However, the neighbors had taken everything that my grandmother had stored there. In March of 1945, the Americans came to their village and took over many of the homes to use as their quarters. As a result, my mom and her family had to sleep in a hay barn. She knows that they had, to, they had had to sleep in much worse places than that during the war. On a humorous note, she said, as children, they were told that the Americans were monsters. And when the Americans came to her town, she was very curious and came out of her hiding place to see what the Americans actually looked like. After the war, food still wasn't great, in great supply, and mom said that they had to beg for food. However, things got better. Mom was able to find employment in a radio factory and support her family. Mom took night classes to learn how to type and take shorthand. My mom, however, had a mischievous alternative motive for this. Her sister, Irena, would write in her diary in shorthand, and my mom wanted to know what she was writing in her diary. <laughs> During, shortly after, around the same time, the time frame's not clear from her history, but a farmer had given her a bike, and she would ride that bike, I believe, into work. And one time she was going down a hill and crashed, and suffered a fairly significant road rash to one of her thighs. And there was an American soldier that had witnessed this accident, and so he went over and administered first aid to my mom, and got her home, and then came to her house several days afterwards to clean and continue dressing the wound. She has some stories in her history that I want to read to you in her own words. Um, she did write more about what happened in the war, but it's really dark, and I didn't feel it would be appropriate to mention here. But one of the things she talks about, after the, after the war, she was in a post office, and I'll read this. She says, I was in a post off. One man I never knew approached me and asked if I'm Miss Miller. I said no, but before I knew, I was in his car. He had a very strong grip on my elbow. Where he wanted to take me, I did not know, but I acted as if this was my first car ride. At this time, only a few people had a vehicle. I asked questions about this and that was in the car. He gave me a few bars of chocolate and candies, which I did not take. I was so very scared and just wanted out of his car. While I was asking things, I opened the door and I jumped out. That happened on my sister Irma's wedding day. Everybody of my family was embarrassed because I was very dusty and not myself. I did not make it to the church. I was Lutheran then. So this is how my mom would talk. And I wish I could have had this beforehand because I would like some clarification of what she was saying here. Um, so she missed the wedding, I guess, but you know, that's how she was. Um, she witnessed a lot and had a, a lot of hardships, obviously, during the war. But she does make some entries that I find reassuring. One was in regards to her sister Friedel. And she says, Friedel and I, as Friedel and I grew older, 
At times, we were very silly. Three box, blocks away from our new home was a vacant open place, and in that area we played scenes from some operas. If some people were watching us, they must have thought we were crazy. So even though she had suffered so much, she still was able to find pleasure in simple things. Another thing occurred, and this again, this is one of those things I wish she was here so I could ask her about this, but she said, while I was still working at Ernst Meisling, that was a radio company, there I met a man I worked with, and he was so much older than I. He wanted to be friends with me and have dates. I went out with him a few times and was trying to stop the dates because I knew it would not go anywhere. One evening, he came to our home to see my mom to ask her if I would accompany him on his business trip. My mother had nothing against it and gave her permission. For heaven's sakes, I was 21 years of, old, years of age and did not need anyone's permission to do what I wanted to do. Since a friend emphasized that this trip is strictly business, I agreed to accompany him. His name was Franz Koschitzky. On our way to Switzerland, he says he loves me and wanted to marry me. He was very well behaved. He wrote books and poems. The poems I still have, which I haven't found. He was surely the most different man I ever met. Would like a little elaboration on that, right? <laughs> and then, uh, one day, July 1955, two missionaries came to my home. One was tall, and he said, we are the Mormon missionaries, and come to look you over. <laughs> the tall missionary's name was Alan Coombs. Well, he thought his German language was perfect. He, I think, should have said, we've come to tell you about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> My mother and I must have had a funny look on our faces. Then the other missionary corrected him and told us all about the church. Frida was there also, and I said, we have our church, and left the house with my niece, Gudrun. The Mormon missionaries came back the next day. This day my mother said, this time you two, Frida and I, stay here. I did not give much attention. First of all, I did not know what the word Mormon was, and where is Salt Lake City? The tall missionary was surprised that I did not know where to find Salt Lake City on the map. The other missionary explained to us if I could get a world map, asked us if we could get a world map. Then he showed us where to find Salt Lake City. Then there was no problem. After a while, both of them tried to teach us the gospel, mostly about Joseph Smith. I never heard of that man. By the way, the second missionary was Elder Robert Palfreyman. As Elder Palfreyman moved with his finger on the map to find Salt Lake City, I noticed his manicured hands and fingernails, and also his eyes were so clear. I liked that very much. <laughs> After I spent more attention and asked questions, the missionaries thought they caught a fish. And in quotations, Isolde. They came back a few more times and gave us the Book of Mormon to read, which I did read, but only one third of it. Elder Palfreyman was transferred to the city Coburg. Before he left, he said, asked what, a, what I think about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I told him I have to think about it. My mother did not say anything. One of the missionaries gave me a book of Mormon. Elder Palfreyman said I should read it and pray about it. And after the missionaries came back, Elder Coombs asked me what I thought about the book. I had my own opinion about Elder Coombs. Elder Combs, excuse me. He said if I prayed about it, I would have known that the Book of Mormon is the true book of God, and I would have a better understanding of it. Those two missionaries were very different. After a few weeks, Elder Palfreyman transferred. After, after after Elder Palfreyman was transferred to Coburg, he wrote me a few times and asked me what I do, when I decided to be baptized. He must have prayed a lot for me to join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and he was hoping that he could baptize me. After a few months, Isola had enough thinking and was baptized. Sixth of October, 1956. My mother too joined the church, but later something happened. She changed her mind about the church and left the church. Elder Palfreyman was released from his mission the 30th of October, 1957. Before he left for home, he came back to Guam to say goodbye. Robert asked me if I would like to walk with him. I said yes, and walked with him towards the woods. There was a bank that we could sit and oversee the town. He talked about his family about his tell, and about himself. At the time, I wondered why he's telling me about his family. After his visit with us, he said goodbye. He traveled to France and Holland, and from Holland he did send me a cute pin. And letters followed wherever he went. When Elder Palfreyman arrived home in America, he told his parents and his siblings about me. 
and before I knew, letters from my home arrived at my home. Fila was very suspicious about all this. After about a month or so, Robert wrote me a letter if I want to come to America. I always like to travel, and of course I said, but I thought I'd fit for a visit. Robert had to spell it out for me, not for a visit. He wants to marry me. Now, I decided to take the risk <laughs> and marry Robert G. Palfreman. Aha! It took me a long time to spell the name Palfreman correctly. <laughs> now, I have to say goodbye to my family. It was not easy. I left from the Stuttgart airport. My mother would not, would not like to come to see me off. Friedel talked me into it. That was the last time I saw my mother. I think it was hard for my mother also. For her trip, my, my trip was just too far away on the other side of the globe. My mom and dad were married on December 26, 1958. They lived in Pasco, Washington, where dad worked as a pharmacist. I was born on September 8, 1959. Mom had a tough time with her pregnancies and comments how sick she was, how sick she was with all three of her pregnancy. She states, Eve gave Adam an apple, so he must suffer. I must have given Robert a whole bushel of apples. <laughs> <laughs> my sister Rosvita was born on June 10th, 1961 in Pasco. As soon as my parents brought her home, they knew something was wrong. Later that year, my parents moved to Ogden. The first thing they did was find a doctor for Rosvita. He diagnosed her with cystic fibrosis. There wasn't anything that could be done for her. My mom comments on how hard it was to see her suffer so greatly and how much it still hurts as she was writing this. Many, many years later. While Rosita was in the hospital, my dad developed a bleeding ulcer and had to be hospitalized too. Mom wanted to be with them in the hospital and take, help take care of them, but she couldn't because she had to take care of me. One day, my mom's, excuse me, one day my dad's mom was able to watch me so my mom could go to the hospital, but it was too far to walk. So she decided to break the law and drive a car to the hospital. The state would have it. A police officer saw her driving and started to follow her, which obviously made mom very, very nervous. After she parked the car at the hospital, the police officer just smiled and waved. She says she was very shaky afterwards. Sadly, my sister died on this Easter day, April 23rd, 1962. My dad continued to be sick for quite a while, and as, as a result, lost his job. As a result of this, my family was basically destitute. Soon after Rosvita's death, my mom was able to get and job as a seamstress where she worked for about five years. After some time, my dad's health improved and he was able to find employment. After a few years, my parents were able to buy a home in the mouth of Ogden Canyon, and this was a very, very happy time for my mom. As I reflected about, upon this when I was writing this, one of my mother's methods of discipline came to mind. When I or one of my friends would be misbehaving and not behaving in a manner that my mom thought was appropriate, she, in a lightning fast motion, would grab us by the ears and give us a big yank on our ears. And it's amazing my ears aren't the size of an elephant's. <laughs> on September 26, 1970, my brother Carl was born. Sadly, he had breathing problems after he was born, and later his test came back for cystic fibrosis. As Carl got older, he had to be admitted to the UV Medical Center for treatments for CF. And as he got older, those, frequency, those visits became more frequent. And Mom spent a lot of time with him in the hospital. Thankfully, Mom's employer was very accommodating. After Tina and I got married, Tina's mom, Luella, became very good friends with my mom. Her mom makes several entries in her history about what a good person she was. And she always had time to talk to mom. Another funny story about my mom. This is kind of epitomizes her personality a little bit. T 
Tina and I got married on August 23rd, 1985. And in September of that year, I started medical school at the University of Utah. We lived on 2nd North, just east of Main Street. In October of 1985, a bomb went off at that intersection. This is, uh, this is the time, a period when Steve Christensen and Kathy Sheets were killed by separate bombs. The car was on fire, and there was a person that was hanging halfway out of the car. And so I ran down there, and there was a man already standing there, and we pulled this person out of the car over to the grass strip across the street, where now it's the conference center, but it was the, uh, um, I'm blocking on the name, it was a, there we go, thank you. And uh, started administering first aid to this, this guy. And soon afterwards, the, interestingly enough, soon afterwards, the um, uh, news media was there, way before the paramedics got there. And so they're filming all this. And um, in the news clips, some of the news clips, you can see me kneeling over this person, administering first aid to them. And I'm in gray, pa gray pants and a gray jacket. And I'm wearing top siders, which you don't have to wear socks with top siders, okay? <laughs> and my, my mom sees me on national TV without any socks on. She's appalled. She calls me up and she says, Bruce, that are your socks. Now, I have to explain why, okay, my mom called me Bruce growing up. And when they registered me in junior high, they registered me under Richard. And I was just too shy to make the correction, and so I always went by Richard from that point on. So that's, I'm not multi-personality, I just went by Richard from then on. Anyway, she wasn't even concerned about what had happened. She was so concerned that I'm TV and I don't have any socks on. <laughs> that epitomizes his older. After I graduated from the U, I did my internship and residency at the University of Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia. While there, Carl, Mom, and Dad were able to come out and visit us. And uh, it's probably our first two Father's Days there. When I called them on Father's Day, it turned out that I also would tell them that they're going to be a grandparent again. And my mom writes this, I wonder if this is going to be the news every Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and while there, they were able to visit many of the attractions, histori historical attractions that were there. At the end of March 1993, Carl had to be admitted again to the hospital. During that time, was it, Mom was able to spend a lot of time with him, and Carl didn't think he would ever go home this time. During that time, they planned his funeral. On April 27, 1993, Carl asked Mom if it would be okay if he stopped fighting so hard to stay alive. He wanted her permission, because he knew how hard this would be on her. She told him, of course, it was okay, and that we have an eternal family, and that we will be together again. On May 1st, 1930, my brother Carl died. At the end of June 1993, my family and I moved to Littleton, Colorado, where I started my practice. While there, Mom and Dad were able to visit us a couple of times and spend some time with their grandchildren. And again, take advantage of some of the local attractions, Pikes Peak, Pikes Peak, for example, in the Air Force Academy. After my dad's retirement, his health was declining. In the spring of 1999, I was offered a position in Logan, which I accepted so I could be closer to mom and dad. We moved there in May of 1999. It turned out to be the right decision. Dad died on February 6, 2000, my daughter Tesha's birthday. Not too long afterwards, Mom moved to Logan, to Logan so she'd be closer to me and her family. <coughs> I know that this has been on the dark side, but these are a few of my mom's events that she recorded in her history and journal. I'd like to now relate some of the happier times in her life. When she lived in Germany and after the economy had improved, had improved after the war, she had gone on trips with her uh, sister Friedel to Switzerland and to other cities and to the wooded areas in Germany. She dated and she wrote about how she and her sister Friedel would play practical jokes on their dates. She joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
After my, mom and dad got married, mom loved to go to the sweetheart balls that the church would host at that time. She loved to dance, especially the waltz. She loved going to Yellowstone. She loved going to the Uintas. She was able to return to Germany three times after she married dad. She was visited here by her sisters and nieces from Germany while she lived in Ogden and Logan. She was able to travel to many places in the United States, including Alaska. She was able to go on a cruise with dad and Carl. After moving to Logan, she was able to spend more time with her grandchildren and attend birthday parties and holidays with us. Knowing that she loved the opera, we took her to several opera operas that were being performed in Logan. Logan has an excellent opera company. She was able to see her grandchildren pursue their interests. She was able to enjoy her great-grandchildren. Uh, Through her hard work and sacrifice of time and money, her sons were able to attend college. She and my dad provided the opportunity for, for me to pursue my goals. All of my accomplishments have been made possible because of her and my dad. She was a great example of fortitude. She suffered great faith as evidenced by the excerpts. September 4, 2021 was truly a happy day for mom. She was finally reunited with her daughter, son, and husband after successfully fulfilling her mortal stewardship. I'm so grateful for all that she has done for me. I love her and will miss her. I'm grateful that she joined the church and that I was raised by a faithful and loving mother. I'm grateful for the restoration of the gospel and saving Lawrence as it allow me to be united as a family for eternity. Of this I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We, before we proceed here, I just have to inform you, we were going to have a lunch cater, but because of COVID and the unwillingness of people to be hired in the food industry, we're unable to get a caterer. So my mom loved the tartlets at Neater's. So we, uh, we have a gift card for all of you <laughs> to pick up and go to, ne to Neater's and celebrate my mom's life. <laughs> I am uh, very humbled to to speak for just a few more minutes and I'll keep this brief and to the point. I want to imagine in your mind the most glorious, beautiful path laying in front of you. And, when this burn, and within this, you have burning desire to explore this path and to see where it will take you. As you travel this path in your hills and valleys and beaches and vistas, as well as the areas that are very challenging and require hard work and tough choices. As you continue to explore down this path, you come to a point in a glorious path in this glorious path, where you find a particular fork. This different, <clears throat> the difference this time is that you discover that one path has a beautiful gate, the other does not. You are now having to decide which path you must take, the one without the gate, or to take the one that means you must open it and enter through that gate. Which path will you take? They both lead eventually to a similar destination. How will you decide to make that choice? The path, the one that requires it to enter through the gate in the church referred to as the covenant path. D. Todd Christopherson states, and I quote, what is the path, covenant path? It is the one path that leads to the celestial kingdom of God. We embark upon this path at the gate of baptism and then pass it toward the steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness and hope in the love of God and of all men, the two great commandments, to the end. In the course of the covenant path, which, by the way, extends beyond mortality, we receive all the ordinances and covenants pertinent to the salvation and our, to our salvation and exaltation. Our overaching covenant commitment, <coughs> our overaching covenants, Commitment is to God and the will to be obedient to his commandments in all things and that he shall command us. Following the principles and commandments of the gospel of Jesus Christ day by day is the happiest and most satisfying course in life. 
I truly believe that our sweet Belle Zelda knew this kind of path very well and kept her the best she knew how. I knew she knew the Savior, his love, the power of repentance, and allowed the power of the Lord's of Savior's atonement to be part of who she is. She chose to open the gate of baptism and enter into the path to make the sacred covenants with Heavenly Father. As I know without any doubt, her Savior will lead her back. And in his presence and his loving arms, and to all <coughs> those that are standing on the last gate, immortality, to welcome her home. Uh, I don't know why I'm a little teary on I just grew to love as though the her spiritual <coughs> spirited, fiercely self sufficient woman devoted to Christ. I had an opportunity the last week to go and visit with those elderly. I don't think she really knew who I was, but I sat there and listened to her and, and helped her. And while I was there, I felt that the, how close the veil was at that time in her life and felt her love for the Savior. That was a very sacred experience for me because it took me back to a time when I was 16. I think the reason why I have such a love for, and for Zelda was she reminded me of my spunky grandmother. Same size, same <laughs> attitude. The stories, still the same. She was a spunky English woman, not German, but she was proper, she was brown. And I just I just fell in love with, with Zelda because of that, and that love for her. I had the privilege of watching my grandmother pass away in my bed as a 16-year-old kid. That experience brought to me a testimony that I know without any doubt the veil is closed at the time of death. That those on the other side are there to welcome them back. There is no doubt that her husband was standing there walking her back home. I want to testify to you that I know of the Savior love. And I know when we're on that covenant path that when we return and make choices, that we too will return to the loving arms of our Savior. And there, bask in His love for each of us and the love of our loved ones. I know without any doubt that this is not the end, but yet just a different date open in our path as we return to live with our presence of our Heavenly Father and with our choice loved ones. I testify that death is not the end, but is the passing through the gate that leads to the loving arms of our Savior. And I testify <coughs> this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> At this time, we'll have a closing song, a walk with God, after which a closing prayer will be offered by Terry Burloff. And then the inner will be at the mortuary and the dedication of the dedicatory prayer will be by her son, Richard Powder.
our Father in heaven, we have gathered this day to remember Isilda and those who have gone before. We are thankful for their strengths and their gifts, which they have passed on to us. Father, we thank thee for the joy of families. And we thank thee for the great blessing of being a part of thy eternal family. We are grateful for thy plan for us. And we thank thee for our Savior, Jesus Christ. May his redeeming sacrifice bring us peace and hope. We pray for the Palfreyman family at this time, that they might feel our love and thy love for them. And we pray for the comfort of the Spirit to be with us. Father, we, we love thee and are so grateful for our many blessings and grateful for the life of his Isolde. And we ask these things humbly this day in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, at this time we'll make our way down to the grave for the dedication. You're welcome to follow just behind our hearse and limousine and we'll meet up down there. Gentlemen, for those of you serving as pallbearers, we'll invite you forward at this time. Thank you. 